Welcome. What's going on, WCJ students? I'm glad you're here. Do me a favor. Get up on your feet. Get up on your feet. Look to the person beside you and say, it's so good to see you. That's right. That's right. Now look to the person behind you and say, you look great tonight. Just go ahead right now. That's right. Okay, here we go. First night back, we're going to have a little bit of fun. But before we do that, we got to get pumped up. So in order to do that, just go ahead and maybe get a little space, okay, arms length apart. Feel free, get in the aisle, whatever you got to do, all right? I'll wait. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, now just follow me. Hands straight up, straight up. And we're going to go down and touch our toes. Here we go. One, two, three. That's great. All right, perfect. Perfect. Now, you're going to turn to your right, my left. You're just going to give a big old high five to the person next to you. And if you didn't get the other person, they're missing out on it, go ahead and turn around. Give them a high five. Jake, what up, what up? All right, here we go. We're going to have a little bit of fun tonight, so I need your help. Let's do it. Here we go. Get those hands together like this. Follow me. Here we go. Clap.
You guys sound incredible. Thanks for singing. Go ahead and take a seat. Alrighty, how's everyone doing? Everyone glad to be back? Yes? What's Anyone? up, Jay? What's going on? Zach, before we get started, yeah. just have a little honor. Just want to recognize someone. Okay. Uh, Tucker Lau, are you here? Tucker Lau last night hit 1,000 points in his high school basketball Woo! career. Congrats, Tucker. We're all proud of you, buddy. That's Good what job. I'm talking about. All right. How's everyone doing? That was not bad. Let's do it again. How's everyone doing? Cool. Everyone stand up. Everyone stand up. Take your pizza. Put it on your chair. Take your phones. Make sure you don't chair. sit on it. All right. So if you've been anywhere on social media for the past week or two, you've seen this incredible meme come out. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone? Chandler. Chandler does. Chandler. What is it? Bernie Sanders. Everyone Dang seen it. the Bernie Sanders meme? Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So in the past, we've played a game called Will It Burn, which you, we've obviously found out if things are going to burn or not. So tonight. Things were burnt. Tonight, we are playing Will, Will It Bernie. It Bernie. Will It <laughs> Bernie. All right, so what's going to happen is we're going to show a picture. And you have to decide if the Bernie Sanders meme is internet worthy or not. Now, if there's any age group or any generation to decide this, it's yours. All right? So it says thumbs up, yes, thumbs Cancel down, culture. no. What's going to happen instead of thumbs up? If you think it's yes, you're going to run to this wall. And if you think no, you're going to run to this wall. Whoa. Sound good? Get you moving a little bit, get the blood pumping. All right? Give us the first one. Where's Bernie Sanders? There where's, he is. Where's Bernie Sanders? He's the guy in the blue, right? <laughs> All right, I'm going to start. I think it's totally internet worthy. Totally internet worthy. Internet worthy. Come on to over To my here. right, your left. Come on. Not internet worthy. Not internet worthy over there. Your right, my left. I'm going to say thumbs down. What? That's hilarious. No one's a horrible person. Everyone is beautiful. Man. That was not nice to say. That's a great, great picture. All right, give us the second one. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this one goodness. was really hard for me at first. If you don't know what it is, it's the Avengers going into battle in the latest Avengers movie. Yeah, like the Avengers, like Superman and Bernie, Batman. Bernie Sanders is Wonder on the Woman. far right of the picture if you can't see him. Oh, yeah, there we go. I, I'm yes, Jay is no. If it's not internet, oh, yeah, I'm no. just kidding. I'm coming over here because that's not even worth being on the internet at all. Bernie Sanders is not compared to you an Avenger. You can't even see it. All right. All right. Give us the next one. That's a good one. That's great. I'm going over here. Very nice. Very nice. Internet worthy for sure. Oh, yeah. We got everyone over here. This is a great picture. I love it. Yeah, hey, that guys. does look like Babe What's, up? What's happening? Oh, Mario. Oh, that's also great. I'm staying over here. If you think it's internet worthy, get on over to that wall. Eddie, you don't think it's internet worthy? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Give us. <laughs> Has anyone seen The Office? It's where they do the interviews. Oh, we have a few strayers. Oh, get. Oh, we got some more. All right. If you're asking, yes, liking The Office is a personality trait. Yes. Yeah. I'm over here. I think it's great. Oh, Shaylee's never watched The Office. Oh, The Beatles? All right. Where is he? The most He's famous on the car in the back. Of I'm walking time. over here. No shame. I don't think it should have been on the internet. If you look closely, that's the Jonas Brothers. If you have to look long enough, it's not worth it. I'm just going to say it. It's not worth it. Oh, we got some more. Friends. That's Friends. Oh, yeah. That's great. I'm coming on over here. I did not like this TV show. Oh, I show. love friends. I don't like it because I don't have any friends, so oh. it kind of makes me feel left out. It's Jay, I'm your friend. Nope. <laughs> nope. Oh, we're split like kind of 50-50-ish, give or take. All right. All right. Give us the next one. Oh. That's just some bad I Photoshop job right there. Because. That's rough. <laughs> toilet paper. And there's a sh there was a shortage of it. Yeah, I was old enough to remember when we were all out of toilet paper. That was like last year. That was yeah, that was a crazy time. 
Stranger, Stranger Things. Stranger Things. I'm I over like here. It. I'm over here. That's on me, Taylor. Sorry. <laughs> it's Stranger Things. If you can't see, he's in the middle there. All right. All right. Forrest Gump. That's a good one. Are y'all too young for Forrest Gump? <laughs> Who's watched Forrest true, Gump? True story. Never seen it a day in my life. Yeah, Chandler hasn't either. I feel like, yeah. Levi, who's the actor that plays Forrest Gump? Good job. It's Tom All right. Hanks. All right. <laughs> Doggo face. That's a good one. Does anyone even know this? Okay, like I said, if you have to struggle to see it, it's not worthy for me. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? He's drinking cranberry juice, skateboarding. Give me another. Hey, Bernie, where'd you get those mittens? Yeah, that's rough. I'm staying over here. That's a neck. That wasn't funny. Yeah. Just, just not great. That was it. That was really? it. Everyone have a seat. Thanks for playing. Awesome. Thanks for playing. Jacob, which one was your favorite? Um, Friends. Friends was a, a great show, one. Jacob. Friends was a great one. All right. Well, welcome to WCJ students. How's everybody doing tonight? How's everybody doing? I know it's rainy and cold and every teenager I talk to is tired, but I hope you are having a great week. It is so good to have you back here. It has been quite a few weeks since we've been back here on Wednesday night, so we are so excited that you've chosen to join us. Please remember to use this as an opportunity to invite your friends, so make sure you're inviting other people. Um, not a whole lot of announcements. Um, first of all, though, with you know everything always up in the air, we want you to be able to get all those updates. And so please text your name to the number on the screen so that you can be signed up for our texting service so that you can get all the updates about what's going on in our ministry. And then you're especially going to want that um, for guests and, um, and members for what will be coming up in the spring and summer. So any events that we do, any get-togethers, special stuff, you're going to need to have your name in that texting service for... Um, dates, times, prices, all that kind of stuff. So make sure you're signed up for that. And then we have small groups going on right now. Many of you have been involved in our small groups so far, and we are so excited about what the Lord is going to do through that ministry. So Sunday mornings at 945, our small groups, we're meeting in here. We're divided up into groups, and so we would love for you to be a part of that, 6th through 12th grade. And um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. But it is going to be a great time. It's going to be a great year in our small groups, and you can use that as an opportunity to bring someone as well. Maybe they don't like you know, being around a lot of people, bring them to a smaller group, and we would love to have them. So um, I'm excited about what the Lord's led in my heart, what we're going to be going through as a group, and um, I'm excited to see all of your faces. I love you dearly, been praying for you, and it's going to be good to be back together. So let's pray um, before we go back into worship, and then um, as always, remember that as we transition and as we go into worship and reading God's Word, this is a time to focus and, um, and really tune into what the Lord wants to teach you tonight. So um, so let's pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you for this night and thank you for every single student that you've brought into this room, God. I pray that you would open their ears to hear you and their hearts to receive you, Father God, and that we would see you do incredible things here tonight, God. I pray that you would keep us focused and God, that you would remove any distraction and God, that any plan the enemy has to disrupt tonight, Father God. We pray that we would see you move and see you work and no one else, God. I pray that as we open your word and as we sing these songs, God, that we would be able to sing these words um, with sincerity, God, knowing that they're truth, knowing that we're crying out praise to you, Father God, and I just pray that we would be overwhelmed by your presence, God. We love you and we thank you for this time. Amen. You can stand. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. 
Pray to rescue story. Jesus, come and wake our faith and break through every doubt. And we'll sing glory as walls come crashing down. I feel something changing I feel something changing in this room the Dry bones awake and start to move Things that we thought were dead Are coming alive to worship you Salvation come, we want to see you glory. We pray miracles be done, we pray to rescue story. Jesus, come and wave our faith and break through every doubt. And we'll sing glory as walls come crashing down. To the Prince of Peace. And to the Prince of Peace, to the King of Kings, to the Great I Am, to the Lion and the Lamb, to the Holy One, to the Cornerstone, and to the Sacrifice, to the Way, the Truth, the Light. To the Prince of Peace, and to the King of Kings, to the Great I Am, to the Lion and the Lamb, to the Holy One, to the Cornerstone, to the Sacrifice, and to the Way, the Truth, the Life. Everything you got, we want to see it. Yeah. We want to see salvation come. We want to see you, Lord. We pray the miracles be done. We pray the rescue stories. Jesus, come and wake our faith. We pray through every time. And we'll sing glory. Walls from crashing down. Oh, as walls from crashing down. Oh, as walls from crashing down. Amen. Hey, pray with me tonight. God, we are so, so grateful. Lord, I'm excited to be in the room with students tonight. God, it feels like forever. So we're grateful uh, to be in this room. Thank you for the songs we were able to sing. Thank you for the fun we had. And I pray right now, uh, Lord, that we would get real. Uh, Lord, may we get serious. And uh, may tonight just be uh, a night where we listen. And Lord, we hear from you and leave different. So God, speak to us. Be with Jacob as he comes. And we'll dive into your word here in just a moment. We love you, God. Thank you for this night. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for singing. Go ahead and take a seat. All right. Well, I have missed being able to worship with you guys. Can you please give them a hand and tell them thank you for leading us in worship tonight? Awesome, awesome, awesome time of worship, and y'all sound incredible. 
sounded like y'all have missed it too because you're singing extra loud tonight. Um, but I, in our small groups, what we've been doing is we've been gathering information about what you guys are involved in, hobbies you have, interests you have, and all that kind of stuff. So I just want you to just kind of popcorn, tell me what are some things that y'all are involved in right now? Just shout it out. Soccer? Fortnite? School. What was it? Who else? Drama. Wait, like acting. Acting. Okay. I'm involved in drama. Okay. We're just going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and get it all out there. Anybody else involved in drama right now? Um, No, I'm just kidding. So these things that you're involved in, we have soccer, cheer, dance, drama, team, um, band, football, basketball, you know, all of you are involved in different things. With each of those things comes a different role that you have to play. Now, I did hear someone say Fortnite. This might not be as relevant (laughs) to someone playing Fortnite. Maybe it does. But everyone has an identity shaped by the roles that they play. And so if if one of your roles is that you're in the band, then you have certain expectations of that role, right? And when those are listed out before you, what you're not going to do is show up at football practice with your instrument and stand on the sideline and practice your instrument, right? You just don't do that. And if you're a cheerleader, you're not going to go to soccer practice and try to fulfill your role as a cheerleader at soccer practice because the two don't fit. Now, maybe there should be cheerleaders at soccer games, but you're not going to go to the soccer practice. And so each of you has various roles that you play, and with that comes expectations of certain actions in your life that you have to be taking to measure up to that role. So whether you're a soccer player or a basketball player, whatever, or some other roles, like if you're a friend or a sister or a brother or a son or a daughter, which all of you are, um, or whatever else. All of those roles come with expectations, and your actions have to line up with that role. And so I want you to think about the different roles that you play in your life, the different expectations you have, or job descriptions for some of you that are in paid positions. Um, But then to take it deeper, what about your role as a Christ follower? Because notice that wasn't something that somebody shouted out, like a role that you play in your life. And so we have a role if we are followers of Christ. Our role is a Christ follower. So how are we expected to act as followers of Christ? What are the things that are expected of us? What are the actions we should be taking to fulfill our role as a follower of God? The Israelites in the Old Testament, they were God's chosen people. They had, to, they had a role as God's chosen people, they had things they were supposed to do, but the problem was they had to be reminded of how they were supposed to act over and over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. How many of you, your coaches, have to remind you what you're supposed to be doing on the field? Just be honest. Thank you for your honesty. You, you've all had a coach yell at you before and be like, this is what you're supposed to be doing, right? And then you go and you like, you're walking away and you're like... <laughs> He's such a mean coach. I hate him. You know, when really you just didn't do what you were supposed to do. And so we've been told that before. We've been reminded over and over of things we're supposed to do. As a child of someone, how many of you had to be reminded over and over of the actions you should be taking as a child of someone in your household? How many of you get in trouble on a daily basis because you're not fulfilling your role? You're not taking out the trash. You're not doing your various chores or you're being a terrible sibling. We have any terrible, mean siblings in this room? How many of you want to call out a sibling that you may have in this room? I'm just kidding. Don't do that. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. So you have those roles as well that warrant different actions. And so these Israelites, they had this role they were supposed to be fulfilling. And God had to remind them over and over how they were supposed to be acting. And knowing that they would fail frequently, God initiated the system of sacrifices. They had this system that they could sacrifice animals to atone for their sins. But the problem with the Israelites is this sacrificial system we had they viewed it kind of as a get-out-of-jail-free card. They were kind of abusing the system. And instead of truly repenting and trying to live God-honoring lives, 
they were relying on these sacrifices to just kind of make everything better. They were missing the point and they were making God angry. And this sacrificial system was supposed to provide a way for people to humble themselves before God, not give the Israelites just an excuse to sin even more. You couldn't just go make a sacrifice and then go sin and then be good. You'd have to do it again. And so they were in this cycle where God had to keep sending people to remind them, hey, this is who you're supposed to be. This is the track you're supposed to be on. Here's the things you're supposed to do. And so just like the Israelites, we're not supposed to just keep sinning because we know we can ask for forgiveness. You can't fool God because he knows the intent of your heart. God cares more about what's in your heart than all of the rituals you try to do and all of the things you try to complete. And so just God wanted the Israelites to be a holy and set apart people. He wants us to be holy and set apart and different than the rest of the world. We have a role to fulfill. There are certain actions we must take to fulfill that role. But because the Israelites weren't getting it, God sent the prophet Micah. Everybody say Micah. God sent the prophet Micah to answer the question for the Israelites, how are we supposed to be acting? What are our expectations? What are God's expectations of us? And so his answer is in Micah 6, starting in verse 6. So if you have your Bible, scroll there. Trust me, that's what we have to say for most of you these days. Um, And so if you have your physical Bible, which many of you do, turn to Micah chapter 6. And here's what his word says, Micah 6, starting in verse 6. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And so this passage, what Micah is telling them is he's giving them three clear examples of what God expects from his people. And so this is the series that we're going to be in, Act, Love, Walk, where we're going to be dissecting these three examples. And so tonight we're just going to tackle one of them. But these, aren't, these three things, they aren't just rules to follow. They're signs that their hearts have been turned to God and that they were following him. And so for us today, these things that we're going to dissect over the next three weeks, these are not just things that we should check off and try to complete and then go on about our day. No, these are things that should show the rest of the world that our hearts have turned to God and that we're following him. And so as followers of Christ, we are expected to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And these are things you cannot accomplish on your own. But these are things that must be a fruit from your relationship with God. And so the first component of Micah 6 a is to act justly. So that was our intro. Now we're going to get into the meat of this. Um, other translations that might say something like do justice. That's what my, my Bible says. And so do and act are interchangeable. Uh, but we talk about a lot of injustice in our world today, right? That's a very hot topic right now. And it's very popular for us to say things like we stand for justice or justice for so-and-so, fill in the blank, right? Those things are very popular these days. But what does scripture call us to do when we read act justly or do justice? What well, goes deeper Sorry, about to rain on your social media parade. It goes deeper than getting behind a good cause, okay? What we're called to in Scripture, it goes deeper than just reposting something someone else posted and said, well, I'm standing up for that too. Okay, well, according to Scripture, you're not really doing justice. You're not really acting justly. You're not doing what we're called to do. And so a lot of us, we use those kinds of posts and we use those kind of phrases and stand up and say those and tweet those and whatever to say that we're doing our part. Well, Scripture calls us to stand up for justice. That's what I'm doing. No, it's not getting behind a good cause. It's so much deeper than that. And so it's a lot about how you conduct yourself. It's more than saying that you're against injustice. It's more than standing up for a good cause. It's about how you conduct yourself. And so acting justly, basically what it means is doing right. Our actions should be just. That's the root of justly or justice. Our actions should be just. The definition of just, y'all know I love a good definition. It helps us understand things better. And so for those of you that don't have a dictionary app on your phone when you're reading the Bible, just get one, okay? It's going to help you. There are resources out there. But the definition of just is based on or behaving according to what is morally right and fair. And so the things that we do towards other people and the way that we act should be described as true and honest and right and fair and just. 
And so our words and our ways towards other people, they should never be the opposite of those things. Manipulative and degrading and wrong and selfish and have these hidden motives in what we say and what we do towards other people. We're good at being manipulative, right? That's why when you walk up to your parents and say, Dad, that sure looks so good on you today. He goes, what do you want? Right? Like they don't ever just say thank you. It's like, okay, how much is it going to cost me? Because we know how to manipulate. We know the right things to say. And, you know, some of you always go to the younger sibling. It's like, go ask mom and dad for this because you're better at getting them to manipulate. See, the saps know. They're shaking their heads like, yep, that's what we do. And so we're good at manipulating people. We're good at using words and actions to, to get what we want. And we know just what to say in the bad way. We know just what to say to hurt people. We know just what to say to get our way with people that we have beef with, right? We know how to manipulate them too. Or we know how to say the right things to get what we want. Now, I don't think we go out each day, wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to ruin someone's life today. But instead of like intentionally doing that and waking up with that mentality every day, a lot of times we do hurt people and we do ruin people's days and we do manipulate people. Not really that we're intentionally trying to ruin their day, but we're just so self-centered that we don't take them into account, right? We're just so self-centered and we want what we want. We want to get out of people what we can get out of them and all that, we, that we don't really take into account how our words and actions affect other people. And so that's why, like, if, you, if someone's ever come up to you and been like, hey, you really hurt me when you said this, and then you're left standing there like, I did not mean for you to take that that way. Or like, I had no idea that that's how you took that. Like, some of Caitlin and I's fights, In marriage, they're based off of that type of thing where I am just so dumb sometimes and blinded that when she tells me like what I did or what I said, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I did not realize that would come off that way or that, you know, that's how it sounded or anything like that. But it's because I'm not taking her into account. I'm being selfish and I'm focused on what I want, what I can get out of a situation and not what she needs. And so to act justly means we stop seeing ourselves as the center of the universe And we start considering how the things that we do affect other people. Emotionally, mentally, physically, but most importantly, spiritually. Is that we, in order to do justice, in order to act justly, we have to be so incredibly aware of how the things we say and the things we do are affecting other people around us and the message that we are giving to other people. And so, how do we act justly? One way to understand that, how we should act and live, is to look at the ways that Micah was telling them in the book of Micah the way that he was warning them to not be living. Okay, so a lot of times if you want to know how to do something, look at what you're not supposed to do. And so he shows us how easy we can go from just to unjust based on our actions, our words, the things that we do. And so the first thing is tearing other people down, tearing others down. He shows us that. Look at Micah chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Sorry, I was in a different book. Micah 3, 1 through 3, he says, And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them up as for the pot and as meat in a kettle. Boy, that's encouraging, right? (laughs) Reese Law just going, (laughs) right? That kind of makes you sick to your stomach. Like that's not a like ooey gooey fun text to read, right? Like we kind of skip those and go, no, like for God so loved the world. And you know, like we don't, when we read stuff, we're like, I don't like the Old Testament. I think I'm going to go to the New Testament. And so, but these are things that are important because right off reading it, you're not going to be like, my life has changed. But when you really look at what Micah is telling them in this moment, he's saying, hey, You're supposed to act justly, but here's how you're not doing that. Here's a way that you should not be living. And so Michael was talking about these unjust leaders. So we're talking about just right now. He's talking about these unjust leaders and he likens them to butchers. Okay. Anyone, any aspiring butchers in here? Maybe not. Okay, we have one in the back. Um, But a butcher is someone that cuts up animals for food, right? They're cutting up the meat. If you go to the grocery store, they have a butcher counter so you can get your meat cut and all that kind of stuff. Reese, stop throwing up. Uh, (laughs) I'm getting good faces up here. I like to see your reactions to things. But Micah was describing these unjust leaders as butchers 
because they cared for people. These leaders, what he's saying is that they cared for people no more than a butcher cares for the carcass of an animal, right? And so what a butcher is going to do is he's going to get all the good stuff he can off of that animal, and then he's just going to throw the carcass out, okay? He's just going to throw it out. It's trash. And so they cared for people no more than a butcher cares for the carcass of that animal. And the leaders that Micah was describing, they only saw people for the good that they could get out of them. And he was calling them unjust. And so what their problem was is they were using other people without any regard or any thought to their well-being, their needs, or what they may be going through. And you may say, well, those are terrible leaders. That's a gross analogy, but also they're just terrible people. Well, that's a warning for us as well. Is that a lot of times the way we treat people, we're no better than these butchers or these leaders that he's talking about because in our sin, we become so self-centered that we only see people for what they can offer us. We're so guilty of that. Is that we look for friends that are going to help us look better. And we look for the people in the class to sit beside that can give us better answers and that will let us cheat off of their homework. And we look for the, for the relationships in our schools that are going to give us the best status and are going to get us in with the best crowd. We use people for the good that we think they can offer us, the things we can get out of them. And so we have to stop tearing other people down to make ourselves look better and tearing other people down by using them for what we think they're worth and then abandoning them. I've had students come to me broken and devastated about how their friends have been treating them. And I tell them, they weren't your friends. Y'all may have had a good time and had some laughs, but look at how they hurt you. Is that really the kind of friendships you want to be chasing after? When I was working at, at a college, I had a student come to me and um, they, they had gotten caught in an act and they, they'd been doing something at a party that they were not supposed to be doing. Um, they had signed a covenant at this college that they were supposed to be acting a certain way and they were going to be doing a certain thing or they would have disciplinary action. And so that one person that got caught gave me the names of 62 other people that were doing the same exact thing at that party. And when we called in every single one and they found out they had been ratted out time and time and time again, what we help them understand is this group that you're running with that you think is getting you to a higher status and you think is going to get you ahead and all that, you see how shallow every single one of them are because they're all out for the same thing and it's to not go down alone. Because in their sin, they're being self-centered. They're not caring about the ramifications for other people. They're just throwing anybody under the bus that they can to save themselves. It's like they're making deals. Like, well, if I tell you who was doing this, well, well, can I get off for what I've done? And then they would just rat out on everybody else because they're just self-seeking. They're self-centered. And we love surrounding ourselves with people that affirm us and make us feel good. But as soon as they stop praising us and giving us words of affirmation or somebody gets caught or whatever it may be, we drop them. And I know you hate having that done to you, but how many people have stood by and watched you walk away from that friendship and you haven't even realized that you've just left somebody behind because they're not offering you what you need anymore? Or you had some misunderstanding and and they don't realize how, or you don't realize how you've hurt them. But we love surrounding ourselves with people that make us feel better about ourselves and, and make us feel good. But as soon as someone says something cross or you get in a little argument, it's, well, I don't like them anymore. I don't need them because I can go talk to this other group. And then you go to that other group and you start saying, hey, guess what so-and-so did to me? I've had, I've had some of you come up to me and say that. Why, why are you talking to them? We don't like them because of what they did to so-and-so. Do you see in that moment how unjust you're being and you're tearing other people down because you want yourself to feel better and you want your hurt and your anger to be justified. And so you're trying to pull other people down with you. We have to start looking at other people as Jesus sees them. We have to see other people as Jesus sees them. Everyone around us, every person that you don't like and every person that you have left behind and every person that's your close friend right now, guess what? They're either going to heaven or hell. That's the most important thing to understand. They will either spend eternity with God or they will spend eternity separated from God. Everyone around us is going through something. 
Everyone around us has struggles and we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and sensitive to the needs of others and act justly and do justice by being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and knowing how our actions and our words are affecting those that are around us. And so first, we have to focus on who Christ is is, and then second, let him use us to minister to other people and then we can worry about ourselves. We come last. And for so many of us, myself included, there are so many days where I'm at the top of the pedestal. But it's those days that I'm at the top of the pedestal that I fight with my wife and I go off on my kids and I get easily frustrated at other people because I'm just focused on myself and I don't care anything about what other people are going through. And so I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, I've conquered this and here's what, we're, here's what you're supposed to do. No, here's what we are called to do as followers of Christ. We have to see others as Christ sees them. Because when we see people like Jesus does, when you see your parents like Jesus does, when you see your siblings like Jesus does, your teachers, your coaches, random people in the store, when you see people like Jesus does, you have compassion on them and you love them like Jesus loves you. And you're concerned with their eternity and not just with who they are right now. And you don't get bogged down in circumstantial things and really shallow things because really what you're concerned about is the heart of their problems and the heart of why they act the way that they act. When you see people like Christ, you do stand up for injustice, but you stand on the truth of God's word and not on the truth or the untruths of news titles and, um, you know, things on social media and things that your friends have shared and told you and gossip and all that kind of stuff. You don't stand on those kinds of things and say, well, yeah, that's what we're going to stand up for. No, you stand on the truth of God's word and say, these are the things that breaks God's heart. These are the things that break my heart. And these are the things I'm going to care about and work towards because I want to see other people come to know Jesus Christ. And so you're not going to be so concerned with all these other circumstantial things. But when you see people like God sees them, you're going to stand on the truth of God's word and know that they are either spending eternity with God or separated from God. And then when you see yourself like God sees you and you see yourself for who you really are, then you see Jesus for who he really is and then you see your need for a savior every single day and you stop being so self-centered and you focused on Christ and then he can use you because you're not looking inwardly, you're looking outwardly. So many times, like, we say prayers that are just common in the church of like, Lord, give us opportunities to minister to others this week. When really we should be praying, no, open my eyes to the opportunities that slap me in the face every single day that I just ignore because I'm selfish. When I started praying, God, open my eyes to the needs I can meet around me right now. I was floored at the stuff people were going through around me that I had no idea they were going through. And so when, we, when our eyes are unveiled and our eyes are open to what's going on around us, it's amazing the impact we can have on our sphere of influence when we're not selfish and we're seeing others like God sees them. But some of us are guilty of viewing Jesus in the same way that we view other people. You say, oh, it'd be terrible to take advantage of other people. And it'd be terrible just to, you know, get the goods and, and get what you can get out of them and see how they can bless you and help you and then just leave them behind. Like, that's a, such a terrible friend. I can't believe anybody would do that. We do that to the one that gave his life for us on a daily basis. Because we look at Jesus and we try to take advantage of him and we want the blessings that come from a relationship with him. And we want him to provide and we want him to help us when we need him. But man, when we've got the world at our fingertips and it's a great day and we don't feel like anything can, can bring us down. We disregard the Lord. And we do things in our own power. And we do things according to how we want them. We want Him to do all the work. We love to receive the blessings, but we fail to serve Him and honor Him and glorify Him and worship Him. And we tend to just look at Jesus for what He can give us when we owe Him everything. And so in an effort to act justly and to do justice, may we not treat others that way, but may we especially not treat the Lord that way. Because we do it so often. And so not only do we tear others down, but Michael warns us that we act unjustly by abusing our influence. 
Micah tells us about some unjust leaders, again, that abused their influence and their power to get what they wanted. Look at Micah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Micah says, Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is in the power of their hands. They covet fields and then seize them, and houses and take them away. They rob a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. These people... These unjust leaders that he's talking about, what they had was influence and power, and they abused it. We don't know what it's like for leaders to abuse their power, do we? (laughs) We see it every single day. Is it when you get a little bit of influence and you get a little bit of power, you get hungry and you begin to see how you can get ahead and you begin to forget how it affects other people. And so that's what these leaders were doing. They were using their influence for selfish gain. And I want you to know, you're like, how does this apply to me as a teenager? Like, I'm a little nobody. Like, I sit in the back corner desk of my classroom and I try not to be seen. And, you know, and then I gossip a little bit at lunch and have a good time. And then I leave. Like, that's my job as a student. How do I have influence? How do I have power? You have a much bigger influence than you think. Anytime, this sounds silly, but it's true. Anytime you convince the teacher to, you know, give you a minute off and just let everybody sit there and talk, or anytime you convince somebody in the lunchroom to let you have something out of their lunchbox, or anytime you convince your sibling to let you have something and then you do a swap and you let them have what you had, or anytime you convince your parents to take you to a certain restaurant or something like that, do you know what has happened in those moments? You've influenced someone. You've pleaded your case, and you've gotten someone to take hold of your idea and what you want, and you've changed their mindset, so then they do what you wanted to do. And so think, you know, if you're sitting here thinking, well, I don't have any influence. Well, how many times a day do you try to get what you want from other people? And do you try to convince someone that this is the right way to act, and this is the way that we should be talking, and these are the things that you should wear? You have influence and power by the things that you post and the things that you wear every single day. Anytime someone's like, I love what you're wearing. You're like, thanks, I got it at such and such. And then they go and buy it. That's influence. Some of you have it on a more, on a bigger level. You're like a leader or a captain in your team or in your group or in whatever class you have. That's influence and that's power. And some of you one day might be terrifying for us to find out later down the road, but some of you are going to have a lot of power. You might be a CEO or someone's boss one day, and you might have a lot of influence and a lot of power. And so you have a bigger influence than you think, and you can act justly by using your influence for the kingdom of God. Everything you do and every word you say, I want you to hear this. It is being observed by someone. We had a shocking conversation yesterday about just how you really never know who's watching. You really never know who is taking note of what you're doing and who is sharing that information and and how it just grows and grows and grows. You never know who's watching and you're always being observed by someone and the way that you treat others and the way that you talk to others either shows them that you are a follower of Christ or that you are living life on your own terms. You're either seeking selfish gain with your influence and your power, or you are trying to use your influence on those in your sphere. That's why we call it a sphere of influence, because it's people you can impact. You're either showing those people that you're in control and the universe centers around you, or you're showing those people, I love you and I have compassion on you because there is a Savior that died for your sins and loves you. You have influence, whether you know it or not, and you are either showing people that you're a follower of Christ or you're living life on your own terms. You either promote Christ or you promote yourself. Even look at today. As we've been back in school, look at today. Really, just think back about today. Did you influence anyone for the kingdom of God? If the answer is no, then you've not tried to use your influence to tell other people that you're a follower of Christ. You've used your sphere of influence to promote yourself. And it may not have been just like this outward blatant thing of like, look at me and what I'm wearing and you should all be like me and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, most of the times it's not gonna be that kind of situation. But it's either for the Lord or for the world. And so acting justly is about using your influence to build up and encourage others and show them the love of Christ. 
But there are days that I don't do that because I'm selfish. I'm prideful. I'm human. I'm sinful. But it's a matter of what I do with those things and how I let the Lord work in my heart in those moments. Acting justly is ultimately a matter of the heart. Listen, aside from the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you as a result of salvation, we cannot act justly, love mercy, or walk in kindness. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit and the fruit that comes from a relationship with Him that we can conduct ourselves in a manner, in a manner worthy of what He's called us to. And so you may be sitting here thinking, okay, well, how can I act justly this week? And like, how are all these things, you know, what are things that I could do? And, you know, these attainable things that I could check off my list? No, you're already doing it wrong if that's what you're thinking. If you're thinking, how can I do this? We're already doing it wrong. Because your prayer and your motivation needs to be, Lord, how can you use me this week to do justice, to act justly? How can you use me this week in my words and my actions and my motives and my influence to tell other people that you love them and that you died for their sins. Because if you try to do those things in your own power, you will fail. And so this is not like, this series is not like a be, better, be a better person series or a get help quick type thing. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what he can do in our lives. And God's not interested in your good deeds He's not interested in your checklist that you have every day of how you're going to be a good person and how you're going to be nicer and all that kind of stuff. He's interested in your heart. And he wants you to act justly and fairly and rightly and honestly and compassionately out of a sincere love for him, not out of a desire to be good enough or to get recognition. Because if you're trying to be compassionate and nice and kind and fair and all of those things, just so you can be seen as a better person or just so other people will like you and not for the glory of God and to point other people to him. We're doing it wrong and it's not gonna honor the Lord. And so I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I just want you to think for a minute about your influence and those that you have around you. And know that if you're a follower of Christ, I'm speaking to those in this room that know that they are followers of Christ you're a Christian, you are evidence of God's goodness and mercy and love to people that need him. You are evidence of those things of God's character and the things that he's done. You are the evidence of God's love and mercy and goodness to people that need him. And so then when people notice how differently you're living, they're drawn to the reason that you act justly. And the reason that you act justly as a follower of Christ is Christ. That's the only reason that you're doing anything. If you're living a life following him and you're living a life pursuing the Lord, then when people see that you're different, what they're seeing is Christ. So you're the evidence of all those things that Jesus is to other people. And so I want you to think about your day and your past week and your past year and your past however long you've been a Christian and say, have I been that evidence to other people? Have I actually shown them the love of Christ? Have I actually shown them what it means to use your influence for the Lord and to treat others the same and to see others as the Lord sees them and to have genuine compassion and love and mercy on others as a result of him doing that in your own life? Think about that. Have you been the evidence that they need to see that Jesus is real? Being holy means that you're set apart. You're different. And if you're not different, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, but you're no different than anyone else that you hang out with and anyone else in your class, then you're doing something wrong. And trust me, I did it wrong for far too long. And so we have to live in a way that people wonder what we have that they don't. And then students, heads bowed, eyes closed. In those moments that you don't gossip and you don't lie and you don't cheat and you don't treat others with disrespect when you're being encouraged to by other people, you can either promote yourself in that moment or if you have promoted Christ and you've not acted in those ways, 
then when they ask you, why didn't you overreact or why didn't you act in that way? Your answer should be, because I've been changed by Jesus Christ. And so think about what unjust actions and unjust words and motives are in your life that you need to stop doing right now. But it's more than just what you need to do and not do. It's about the condition of your heart and whether you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that tonight, if you've realized, if you've even known over the last few weeks that you are gonna come tonight searching for something, all you have to do is cry out in faith. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve death and hell. I want you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And students, if you say anything like that to the Lord in faith, knowing he's the only one that can save you and forgive you, then you've been saved. And we are ecstatic about that. And we want to talk to you. We want to walk you through what that looks like. So please talk to me after the service if you need anything at all. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for how you're working right now, God. I thank you for your presence. And I thank you that we don't have to wonder if you're going to show up on a night like tonight. We don't have to wonder if you're here, God, but that you're with us every moment of every day. And God, I pray that we would see the work that you're doing around us. And that tonight... There may be students that find victory over sin through the power of your Holy Spirit. And that they may there may may be students in this room tonight that just grow a sincere love for you and begin to act out of that sincere love and not out of obligation. But God, that we would have students that begin living lives that are just and right and honest and fair as a result of what you've done in their lives, God. For anyone in this room that doesn't know you or has just been saved, Father God, I pray that you would give them the boldness and the courage to step up and ask for help, God. And Father, lastly, I just pray for every student in this room, God, that you would bring us to our knees and break our hearts for what breaks yours and open our eyes to the opportunities that are all around us that you place right in front of us every single day and opportunities that we have to show others that you are God. So may we be found promoting you and not ourselves. God, we love you and we thank you for this time. Amen. Students, you can stand.
You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. And you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. And you're never gonna, come on, if you believe that, sing it with us tonight. Well, is it good to be back or what? Yes, we are so excited about um, all everything that we happened in this year. So we love you. We are thankful for you, praying for you. If you need anything at all, please come talk to me or anyone in our leadership, and we would love to help you out. So um, please pick up your trash and throw it away. We love you, and you're dismissed. Have a great week. <laughs>